hit until about 2010. So Instagram, it used to be um, that uh, we would, uh, I guess, I guess the difference between 2002 and going into 2010, we had an opportunity to reach more people. Instagram gave us the opportunity to do that. It gave us the opportunity to be able to showcase our work, but also showcase our personality at the same time. I remember starting uh, my Twitter account and the Instagram account, not fully understanding the power of what it was going to be and, and where it was going to go. And I remember, um, the reason my my name on Instagram is Natasha and KPR is because at the time and KPR was taken and Natasha uh, was taken and so I thought I combined the two and it turned out to actually be one of the smartest decisions I made because what that tells the people that go on our feed is that my business is very much grounded in um, my own personal values and so people know that if they're going to contact us at NKPR they understand that the person and the business are the same. And that was always really important for me. And I remember over the years, we would hire like digital managers or uh, directors of digital. And I remember one person in particular, it was around 2012, maybe 2013, she said, I really think you need to have a separate business account and separate personal account. And I just, I felt really strongly that I didn't want to do that because my bit, I feel like my business is very much grounded in in my values, even though we have a staff of over 30, we do work across across North America, uh, not just in Canada, um, the values are the same. And so for me, social media has given myself and the company an opportunity to make sure that we are grounded in our values. So you see a lot of the cause work that, you do, that we do, um, certainly a lot of the work that we do um, uh, with our clients as well. But I, I, I think, who you are as a human and what you do in business should be the same. Now, Natasha, I, I watched your wonderful TED talk and, and you talked a lot about how uh, you were and continue to be shy, uh, even though some people don't believe you. And, and I'm in the same boat. I, I've described myself uh, as an introvert as well. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, so much of public relations is networking, is schmoozing, is going out and, and you know, being around people. And I'm wondering what your perspective is on what kinds of opportunities um, going online has presented to you that, you know, might have been out of reach if you were at a point where you just couldn't do one more cocktail party and you don't particularly enjoy passing around business cards. Has this push towards going online and even more so this year been more of a blessing? It really has. Um, I'm an introvert that lives the life of an extrovert. And I often, you know, and both of you can, I think, agree to this mm -hmm. and, and understand it really well. Just because you're an introvert doesn't mean that you can't do all the things an extrovert does. It just means that you receive your energy differently and you deplete your energy differently. So for me, online is awesome because I feel like I have this opportunity to actually engage with um, a lot of different people and it doesn't deplete my energy in the same way. Um, whereas if I go into a room with 300 people, what I try and do is I hone in on like one or two or three people and actually have a proper conversation as opposed to doing small talk with a lot, uh, a lot of people. And then I do find that after an evening like that, I come home and my energy is pretty depleted. So I can't do two nights in a row of that because I'm just, um, mentally and emotionally uh, drained from it. So digital media has given me, you know, has afforded me the opportunity and the privilege to actually build a community of people and not feel the same form of depletion. But I wonder if you guys find this, I will say that sometimes like on a weekend, I'll just have to put my phone down and not look at it. And because I do need sort of that mental disconnect um, and I will do that. And you have to know yourself really well to know when, when you're ready for that. Um, but then when I want, you know, that stimulation, I can go back online and get it. So it, it, it's interesting. I think the key with being an introvert and extrovert is you have to know yourself because I'm sure you, you, you guys probably felt the same thing. I remember being in my early twenties and just thinking, I just don't like to go out. I thought I was antisocial. I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And then I, right. Absolutely. And then I realized when I was getting older, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. I Chanel, completely agree with that. 
Absolutely. I mean, I'm not here nodding my head. I'm like, yes, that is so me. I, 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 I relate to that. I'm also as well an introvert that lives a life of, of an extrovert. And when I tell people that, they're like, you've done a TED talk. You, you speak all the time. How could you be an introvert? Um, but it's, it's like what you said, Natasha, I, I deplete my energy differently. And so, yes, I can go on a stage and then I'll come home and I want to just curl up with a book and I don't want to be around anybody. Um, but for me, that was that was why I started my blog in the first place is because I was an introvert and I thought, OK, I like blog. I like being able to interact with people and expressing my thoughts, but I can just hide behind the screen, right? And then once I started writing and people liked what I had to say, they were like, well, hey, why don't you come and speak at our event? And I was like, uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. That's not for me. I'm an introvert. Um, but I can say it, it's possible to overcome that, right? And so it's really, it's that practice makes perfect. As you start to do it over and over, you start to feel more comfortable with that. And that's really what happened in my case. In the beginning, I was terrified. Um, but now I can say that I've actually started to enjoy it, but I'm still very much an introvert. So it's interesting how that happens, but it, it's possible to overcome. So Chanel, you, do you, you have to learn about yourself, right? Like you yes. have to know yourself. And so it's yes. that discovery, you know, of learning what actually matters to you and what, mm -hmm. what, um, what depletes your energy or where you get your, where you get your energy from that will make exactly. the biggest difference and not let, the, exactly. not let any of those things actually stand in your way from doing what, um, mm -hmm. what needs to be done. Exactly. And I find it, it's the passion that's important as well, right? Like once you're really passionate about something, you almost forget that you're nervous. And that was really the case with me. I love talking about personal branding and careers. And so once I'm on, I'm like, oh, I, I forgot I was even scared in the first place. Right. So <laughs> passion is key. Natasha, do you get Zoom fatigue these days? I, I definitely get Zoom fatigue. Um, I try, if we if it's a call with two people, I try and do it as a phone call and not Zoom. I, I think the challenge with Zoom, even though there are certainly so many benefits, I think the challenge is um, you focus differently because you're still looking at yourself and you're, you can't quite gauge tone and you're distracted. And so the amount of energy that I feel um, Zoom takes up is quite different than just doing a phone call. Um, and I just think there's a lot of Zoom right now. Like, I, I mean, on one hand, there's a sufficiency around Zoom, right? You're not traveling or, I mean, you can't travel, but you're, you're not even traveling to a meeting. So you can do a lot more meetings. So um, it's good from that standpoint. But by the end of the day, I actually feel that's where I am depleted. Whereas a phone call I could do, and I don't, I don't get depleted of energy in the same way. But with Zoom, I, I feel like it's like a human interaction. And I really am exhausted by the end of the day. We're just about to go to break now, but when we come back, I want to hear more from both of you on strategies on how to make that Zoom caller meeting more efficient and more fun and how to navigate this world without burning out. So more on that after we turn from the break. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. shops, restaurants, and services are woven into the fabric of our city. We can all help them during these challenging times. Order from them online, purchase gift certificates to use later, order meals for takeout or delivery, send them messages of support on social media. Please do it today. Learn how at ottawa.ca slash buy local. Hey everybody, it's Mark in the Park. Tune in to Rogers TV and watch Mark in the Park as I go on a 10-day interior canoe trip in Algonquin Provincial Park. We get some uh, hard times, some uh, sweaty times. This isn't rain. <laughs> and some old times with some, lots of relics around the park. Lots of fun and pain. Canoeing, awesome. Portages, not so awesome. You're lucky there is no such thing as smell-o-vision. <laughs> <laughs> 
play four games of bingo from the comfort of your own home each Monday at 7 p.m. for your chance to win money from our $2,000 regular bingo or $5,000 super bingo night. Kiwanis TV Bingo, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Rogers TV. Where did she come from? She's just black and white. She told me everything. It's gonna be all right. Welcome back to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. From meetings and job interviews to business pitches and presentations, even happy hours, they're all migrating to the internet, at least until we can beat COVID-19 into submission. Now more than ever with people working from home and social distancing in full force, you need to be prepared to present your best self through that small little screen. Here to get you ready for your close-up, our very special guests, Chanel McFarlane and Natasha Kaufman. Now, while we were chatting during the break, Natasha, you, you mentioned something very interesting in that sometimes people approach you and they express fears or anxiety that they may not be well suited for certain careers because they tend to be more introverted. And your take on that is that this is not the case. No, I, I think the key is really getting to know yourself um, and understanding where you get your energy from. I think someone that is shy can definitely be in PR. I think someone that is shy can do a TED Talk. Um, I just think that you have to maybe prepare differently than, than someone else and understand that you might not be someone, you know, in our industry that can go out every single day and be social, but you are someone that can foster really strong relationships with people because introverts are very good at one-on-one -on -one relationships, not necessarily enjoy, they don't necessarily enjoy large crowds. So it's just understanding what your strengths are um, and how do you make sure that you're amplifying those um, as, much as, as much as possible. Now, Chanel, I'm curious to hear your take on this. Do you see our new primarily online lives as having the potential to be as satisfying as what we had in the past? Or, or do you think it's just sort of a temporary placeholder for the real thing? And, you know, do you see the real thing to be sort of the face to face and all five senses engaged? Like, do you miss the in-person aspect? I do. I have to say, I really do miss in person. I mean, I, there's nothing like being able to interact with someone, especially like myself that's a speaker. I used to love those moments afterwards uh, where you could interact with people in the audience, get to know them. And it's, it's a little different when you're when you're speaking through the screen. Um, but I mean, as, as long as COVID-19 is around, I feel like we have to get used to showcasing our personality through these small little squares. Um, and so it's all about just the preparation, right? There's a lot more work that goes into it. Um, but I feel like it can start to feel satisfying satisfying, but probably not as satisfying, I should say, uh, as being in person. Now, speaking of preparation, and you've obviously prepared very well today, you've curated your space, your background is beautiful. Mm. Um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what people need to know to make a Zoom call a better experience for everyone involved. I mean, I think from what I've mm. seen, most people just sort of, you know, plonk their computer on a desk or some flat surface, and they just hit join meeting, and they don't really think about what's involved, but it's, it's actually kind of mm -hmm. an art form. Talk us through it. Absolutely. Well, I like to see it as being on a movie set, right? So on a movie set, you'd have your decor, you'd have your audio, you'd have your lighting, you have your cameras. All of those things are part of having a really great Zoom call. Uh, and so I actually have a number of different tools and tech that you can use to ensure that you are upgrading your calls and you're presenting your best self. So the first tool I'd say is a webcam. And I know that a lot of our laptops these days, they've come built in with a webcam, but you may have noticed they're probably not the best quality. And so I actually recommend uh, getting a separate webcam that you can just pop right on top of your laptop. Uh, the one that I use is a Logitech C922 Pro Stream, and it just gives you a really crisp, high quality image uh, so that you actually stand out on screen and you can get that from a Best Buy or any sort of, sort of tech store. How much does it cost? You sent us a picture of it that we'll mm -hmm. just pull that up online while we're chatting, but uh, yeah. how much do you invest just in about, something like that? Just over a hundred dollars. I mean, there's a number of different ones that are out there, but you usually find them between a hundred and two hundred dollars. Okay, and then how would you plug mm -hmm. it into your computer? Yes, yeah, so you plug that in just through your USB and it's very simple. As soon as you plug that in, you're ready to go. Um, and then you just, once you go on to Zoom, you're able to select your webcam. Uh, and again, that just gives you that much more crisp, high quality looking image. 
I love that. And there's a couple of other looks so great. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> There's a couple of other accessories that uh, you were talking to us about. Yes. Let's go into those as well. I know there was a laptop yes, stand. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Yes, yes. My favorite is is lighting, right? And so, uh, of course, there's natural light. So if it's a bright day, uh, you can just ensure that you had the lighting actually behind your laptop instead of behind you, because that way you don't have that sort of dark shadow that you can get sometimes. Mm -hmm. But for example, if it's... If <laughs> exactly, ex exactly, Barbara. So for example, if it's, it's night outside or you don't have access to a window or you just want to upgrade, a ring light is a really great option. And so again, you just place that right behind your laptop and it actually comes with a number of different settings. So you can adjust that brightness. You plug it in typically through USB as well, and then you're ready to go. You just brighten up your space really nicely. So that's why I really like that. Uh, but a lot of them also come with a cell phone attachment. So if you're not on Zoom, but maybe you have a live stream on, on your phone for maybe Facebook Facebook or Instagram, or you just want to take a really awesome selfie, you just add on your cell phone there, and then you have that really nice natural lighting. And a laptop stand, you also like that as well. Yes, I do love a laptop stand. And again, just to prop it up, you just have that at eye level so that you're looking right into the camera. And of course, you just want to make sure that you're centered uh, in, your, in your frame as well. Now, you mentioned Best Buy is a great place for that extra webcam mm -hmm. to clip on top computer but the ring light the laptop stand you have a preferred place to source yeah those items well from? nowadays because we're all on zoom calls i mean i feel like you can get them anywhere so of course best buy is a really great place you also have walmart i've seen them as well and then also amazon you're able to to order those items okay great so that that really gets yes. us into sort of the technical aspects of it and i know natasha yes. you had some tips as well on getting yourself prepared for a great zoom call well, I think one of the biggest thing, things is actually be prepared. Um, yeah. We need to remember that a Zoom call is like people are actually seeing you. So you need to make sure you're, you're as prepared as possible for the call, not necessarily looking at your notes and you're actually um, ready for it. I think the other thing too is we need to make sure that we, we um, show people that we care. And so when you're on uh, the Zoom call, I think it's perfectly okay to ask about the person's day, talk about, you know, what's actually of interest and important to the folks on the other side of the Zoom, as opposed to going right into your agenda. Um, and, and I think that's a big part of what's happening right now is that we're in this world of um, we're doing Zooms and we're trying to do our part. But I think we also need to remember that people are feeling kind of unsettled. And so if we can, um, on the call, actually um, give them a bit of relief on every call that we do and make them feel that there's, you know, a, a, people on the other line that actually care about what they're going through, what they're doing, I think that really goes, um, goes a long way. Um, and it is, you know, it's interesting what Chanel said, people do pay attention mm -hmm. to your surroundings and they're going to judge you on it. So like mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, and it is, it's an opportunity for us to actually see how people live. So you really should pay attention to where you put your computer because um, we can all see that. And so um, I, I think that's uh, another part of being prepared and just paying attention to um, where you're actually presenting yourself. Absolutely. I'm and you know, gonna, even I'll add to that point. Today because the TV <laughs> screen behind me and where I was sitting before, as before we got on this call, I was like, mm, the lighting's kind of off. So I need some tips from Chanel as well. But um, I do think that we need to pay closer attention uh, to some of those details mm -hmm. than we ever, uh, ever did before. Absolutely. And I was going to add to your point, uh, Natasha, of course, you know, backgrounds are, are very important, but for some people don't necessarily feel comfortable uh, having their home um, on view and, and, and within their Zoom screen. So virtual backgrounds are also a really great option um, and you can access that through Zoom. Uh, there's free ones. If you just do a quick Google search uh, and type Zoom backgrounds, you're able to just download that. Um, and add that into your Zoom so that you don't have to have your, your background on display. Maybe you just don't feel comfortable with that. You don't have a nice space that you want to show on screen. So that's another option for you to consider as well. Now, I've heard that in, in, you know, in terms of Zoom etiquette that you know, turning your camera off is a big no-no. In fact, I've heard the comparison made that you know, keeping your camera turned off during a meeting is like holding up a piece of cardboard in front of your face after you've been invited into someone's living room. Like you have to get involved. You've been invited into someone's home essentially mm -hmm. when you're on a Zoom call. So you know, turning your camera off is a big no-no. Thoughts on that? 
Um, I, I don't know if I fully agree with that. I would say as the meeting organizer, it's up to you to say what those rules are. If you want people to be on camera, I think you should say that ahead of time. Uh, but we should also be considerate. I mean, we are living in a global pandemic. People have all different situations going on. And sometimes you just feel tired or depleted and you just can't be on screen. Uh, or for example, in my case, I'm also a new mom. And so maybe at the time that I have to jump on a meeting, I also have to nurse my child or get them to sleep or whatever it is. So I think it's about being mindful of everybody's unique situation and saying that ahead of time. And if you know that you can't be on screen for any reason, hoping that you can actually go to whoever the meeting organizer is or letting your team know um, that you won't be on screen for a little while, uh, I think as long as you're letting letting the person know, um, then that should be okay and that should be accepted. Natasha, do you struggle with you know looking in the direction of the camera as opposed to the people on the screen that you're talking to? I, I do because I find you get distracted because you see yourself on the camera, and so it's hard not to. I think everybody kind of does a little bit, um, but. I, I try not to not to look at it, but you can often see people doing a Zoom call and they're like fixing their hair or something because you can't help but mm -hmm. actually look at the screen. Um, and I think that creates part of that distraction. That's why it is in some ways easier to do a phone call, especially if it's not, if it's with under two or three people, because then you're actually able to just focus on what that call is as opposed to just being distracted by um, all the faces and you know i'm not quite sure why when you're in a meeting and you're in a boardroom um, you could have a meeting with 10 people and you just don't feel that same sense and i guess it's because you don't see yourself you're just looking at the people around you and you're focused on them um, so so that could be that could be it and i think that contributes probably to the um, zoom fatigue so, I want to switch gears uh, and, and talk about what it means to occupy that space online. Um, I know, for instance, whenever a new social media site crops up, there's always this mad dash for invitations and for getting a username. But I think people can usually tell that you're only using a platform out of obligation or because you suffer from fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. Chanel, I, I want to hear from you in terms of, you know, when you were starting to put together your personal brand strategy online, um, how did you decide what your goals were and, and how did you decide what was worth your time and what wasn't? Or was it sort of like a learn as you go kind of process? I'd say it's a bit of both, uh, but really it's about thinking what your goals are. What are you actually trying to achieve? And also who's your audience? Who do you want to reach, right? So if you if you know who your audience is and what platforms they use, then that's probably where you want to focus most of your time. I, I like to not spread myself too thin, so I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm everywhere. I mean, I'm not on YouTube and I'm not on a few other platforms, but I try to go on the platforms that I know that I feel most comfortable and I know I'll actually be able to successfully uh, reach my audience. What about you, Natasha? I think a big thing for me, and I, I do this exercise called the five I am's, and I actually do it every year and really focus on what are the five things that are important to me um, about me right now? And it, it's big, it's grounded in values. And so um, I will often um, sort of look at what are those things and then make sure from a social media uh, perspective that I'm demonstrating them and living them so that I'm being able to project my most authentic self all the time. Um, and it really helps. I mean, some of your five I am's will be consistent. I mean, one of mine is always like, I am authentic. And I look at that and I think, you know, if I'm posting something, is it really authentic to who I am? Or am I getting caught up in the noise of what's happening in the world right now? And I'm posting it because I feel like I should, as opposed to because it's really, um, uh, part of who I am and so it keeps me in check mm -hmm. and I think it's an exercise that we should do on a, on a regular basis um, where you really are able to uh, hone in on what matters to you uh, the most especially you know right now in your life mm -hmm. So even if your reasons for being online are primarily career driven, do you think there should always be some crossover between professional and personal? I know, Natasha, you have a couple of Instagram accounts, one of which is purely dedicated to the love story of your relationship, which is wonderful. Tell me a little bit about the rationale behind that. I mean, I just started that, <laughs> so there's not a huge rationale behind it other than I wanted to be able to journal our um, our memories and our moments, you know, it, it took me a long time to find, you know, the man of like truly of my life, um, my partner. And so um, I wanted to put something out there that 
uh, was more of a journal um, of our of our mo of our special moments, and I didn't necessarily want to um, integrate all of that into my other uh, my other account. But I'm I'm a big believer in work life integration, so I truly believe that who I am in my personal life is absolutely who I am in my business life. Um, and people will often say that when they meet me, they're like, oh, you're exactly what I expected you to be. And that I take that as a huge compliment because um, mm -hmm. I am the same regardless, whether you have a personal relationship with me or whether you have a business uh, and professional relationship with me. So the, the, the personal account um, that I started, honestly, it was just, we came back from a trip from Paris and we had all these really great photos. And I was like, I just want to, post about them. And so I did. And I know that a lot of people that follow um, uh, Natasha and KPR business and personal account anyway, uh, were interested in that. So um, I uh, had a bit of a crossover. I want to hear more about that, um, that very important element of authenticity in both our virtual professional lives and our virtual personal lives. And of course, Chanel, I want to hear your perspective on that as well. We're just about to go to break, but more on that when we come back, don't go away. Each week on Grill This, Smoke That, Steph Legary showcases delicious recipes from across Canada, all done on the grill. Join Steph and his special guests on Grill This, Smoke That, Fridays on Rogers TV. Your mouth can do a lot of amazing things. And your mouth can save a life. Hi, I'm Tom Wong. I'm just one of close to 1,000 Canadians in search of a stem cell match. We need your help. A simple swab is all you need to register on the National Stem Cell Database. You could be the one to save a life. Find the hero in you. After a night out with your friends, there's always options for getting home safely. You could call your BFF, your mom or dad, whoever you can count on for a safe ride home. You could call your favorite cab company or one taxi guy. Or you could use the Arrival Live smartphone app to help you choose your ride. Be it a friend, transit, or taxi, getting home safely is app easy. Now available for iOS and Android devices. Visit arrivealive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive. Drive sober. Tuesday at one o'clock for Gen Zen TV, where I answer your questions one caller at a time, putting the soul back into solutions. Join me here Tuesdays at one on Rogers TV. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. Social media can often feel like an after hours bar that you just have to go to. And once you're there, it's fun enough. And maybe there are some people you like, but then you realize you probably could have just stayed home. The thing about social media is that it's a gold mine of professional opportunities because so many people are active on it. But by the same token, how do you stay authentic? How can you seek out connections who are also authentic? Here in the studio joining us tonight are special guests Chanel McFarlane and Natasha Kaufman, who will be teaching you how to put your best self online in this crazy COVID-19 world. Chanel, let's start with you. We, we talked a little bit before we went on the break about the importance of authenticity. And I'd like to hear your thoughts about, you know, how you put um, your best self online, both professionally and personally, while still staying true to yourself and, and your values. And I'd also like to hear on how you seek like-minded people online as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's all about sharing, sharing what you enjoy and sharing what you like. 
right? People connect with people. And so not feeling afraid to share that book that you read that you really enjoyed or that Netflix show that you just binged and you just can't stop talking about. Share those things because that's what makes you you. And that's how you'll be able to connect with people that have those same interests. But I think even from a, from a job seeker perspective, people want to get to know you and your personality, right? They don't want to just, yes, the, pers- the professional side is great, but the personal side is really what makes you you. Um, and so that's what people want to get to know. Uh, and so that you shouldn't feel afraid to share those things when you can. Do you think that the people you meet online are your real friends or can be your real friends? Like, do you think that relationships that you make and foster online are as important as those in real life? Do you think that, um, mm-hmm. I guess, the, the men that- conception of there's a hierarchy do you think there's some truth to that oh absolutely i mean i have some really incredible friends that i've met on platforms like linkedin and twitter and i very much consider them uh to be friends so i'd say it just it just comes from trying to be your most authentic self sharing the things that are really uh passionate about you things that you really enjoy but i think also just sharing the failures sharing the things that are not so great and i know from from my perspective i when i started sharing the things i was experiencing in my career uh failures that i had i mean one time i, I hosted an event and no one showed up and that was pretty embarrassing and I decided to write about that and it was amazing to see the people that started sending me emails and dms and started connecting with me and saying wow I've been through that too and I never was able to talk about it and so it was really nice to just almost bond over this shared common experience and so really that's that's how you can make friends online it's 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 interesting but from sharing those failures and sharing those things that are maybe a little embarrassing uh, that's how you start to make the deepest connections it seems like there's a lot of rewards for making yourself vulnerable, um, but of course there's mm-hmm. sort of the right time and the right place. And Natasha, when you gave your uh, TED talk on the importance of showing up, um, you must have received a lot of positive feedback on that because you made yourself vulnerable and talked about some of the experiences that shaped and, and formed you. Um, I'd love to hear more about that, but I, I'm also interested in uh, the fact that you brought up the importance of reciprocity and sort of showing up for others is those who have shown up for you. And I, I think that's an element that is, is often um, lost sight of in our society. And, and I think that's why many people get so exhausted when they network, because there's this element of everyone milling about trying to see what it is that other people can do for them versus what they can do for other people. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we need to remember that it is our responsibility to give back to others. I always uh, have said this, that we are put on this earth uh, to make it a better place and to certainly make it, a, leave it better than when we came into it. So I, I, I think that that's our purpose. And, you know, part of the reason that TED Talk was so important um, for me, and I always said that I didn't want to do a TED Talk until, unless I felt that there was something that I could really say that would be impactful in some way. And I think the power of showing up is, is imperative. Um, because one of the, one of the um, things that I talked about in my TED talk was a woman that when I was, I had my son really young, I was 18 when I had him. And I remember being a kid with a kid, not fully um, certain, um, I couldn't fully envision the person that I was going to become. And I met this woman who was um, a, a, a mother, she was a single mother, and she was super successful and had raised her daughter uh, successfully. And so I could see her and I could envision myself in her. And so she didn't even realize she was showing up for me. But by her living her life in the most you know, positive way gave me sort of a vision and a path of I could become this too. And so I think what we need to remember is that we we have the opportunity and the ability to live our best lives and be our best selves, and not just for ourselves, but for those around us. And so being authentic and being kind and, um, and being good humans is really important. And, you know, we say this a lot right now during COVID, we're in this together. And I believe that to be true, then let's also remember that it's our responsibility to make sure that we are truly contributing to the world um, and, and doing good. And that's supporting our local communities as much as possible. And I love everything that you're saying, Natasha, and I loved your example earlier, Chanel, about sharing your experiences online and how it brought all these supporters out from the woodwork. But at the same time, and I, I don't want to come across as too pessimistic, but you know, I think we can all agree that the internet is not always a, a loving or forgiving place. And so mm-hmm. I think it's really 
that we protect ourselves. So how do you know when to be vulnerable and when to hold something back? How much is too much? You know, what, what are some safeguards that you put in place? And especially as a woman mm -hmm. in this world that, you know, knows no geographical boundaries anymore. What, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on the Chanel? Absolutely. I mean, well, definitely I'd have to, to bring up safety, right? You don't want to put out information that would compromise your safety in any way. So that's that's first and foremost. Uh, but in terms of knowing how much is too much, I mean, I think I think you feel that you start to feel what you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, and so if you feel uncomfortable with that, then then don't put that out there. That said, if there's something, a story that you feel like will really resonate with other people, that that's really what you what you want to put forward uh, and, and see what and see what comes of that. Natasha, any thoughts on that? I mean, I would agree. I think you really need to trust mm -hmm. your gut instinct. Your gut really mm -hmm. does tell you and helps guide you to, should I post this? Should I not post this? It doesn't quite, if it doesn't quite feel right, don't post it. And I think, I think that goes back to authenticity, authenticity as well. Are you posting for attention or are you posting because it's really important for you to be able to share what you're about to share? And there's a difference, mm -hmm. right? Because you should be posting not for the likes and not even for the comments you should be posting because it's an opportunity for you to maybe express your vulnerability and that feels important to you so really mm -hmm. uh, do a gut check on the reason why you're sharing or even oversharing for the, for that matter um because you know it, it 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 has to i feel like with every post it has to um, it has to contribute in a positive way to others, mm -hmm. um, whether you're sharing, you know, your love story or your entrepreneurial journey or, you know, whatever that is, it should contribute mm -hmm. in a positive way and somehow or positive way somehow. And so, and if it doesn't, then you kind of have to look at why are you posting it? And if you're just doing it for yourself, then that's fine too. But like, just do a gut check. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll even add to that, Natasha, I think the, the internet has a really long memory, right? And so when you're thinking about posting something, how will you feel if it's online in 5, 10, 15 years? Th think about all those things before you put it online. You want to ensure that everything that you have online is a positive reflection of you because people are going to search you up. That's going to come up and you want to ensure um, that it's something that's positive and not negative. All those MySpace pictures coming to haunt you. I mean, who remembers MySpace? Yeah. My, um, <laughs> both of you, both of you have mentioned the importance of doing a, a Google audit on yourself, um, mm -hmm. like doing setting up a Google alert. Natasha, I see you nodding your head. Is this something that yeah. you advise your clients to do? Well, I absolutely do because you 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 can't keep track of everywhere you're potentially mentioned, and so if you do set up at least your Google alerts, then you know when you are mentioned. Uh, potentially. I, I do think it's really important. I also think that um, people should look, Google themselves and just see what pops up because there are things that pop up from like so many years ago and it actually makes you really mindful of like what you're saying and then there needs to be that consistency and authenticity and if it's not there then I again I go back to like the five I am's and people should do that exercise because it really grounds you in your values and what matters to you and what is most important to you. Um, and then that way, at least there's some consistency in either any interviews that you're doing or what you post online. Um, and, and that way there's, there isn't, you're, you're not a walking, talking contradiction. I'd like to talk more about that I am exercise and also Chanel, I wanted to chat more about um, how you can go about networking virtually, especially if it doesn't come naturally to you. I know there's some uh, tricks that you've got up your sleeve to share with our audience. Mm. We're just about to go to break, so when we come back, we'll talk about all of that and lots more. Don't go away. Monsieur de Champlain, when I finish paddling through this wilderness and reach China, I shall greet them wearing this. Monsieur Nicolet, your mission shall be for the honor of the king and the holy faith. In the summer of 1634, Jean Nicolet set off from Quebec to find a trade route that would link Europe and North America with China. But where is it? Further, I know the place you are seeking. For months, Nicolet pushed through the wilderness, searching for the Western Sea. Goja, Mississippi! What did he say? He said, 
Mississippi, great water. Mississippi, the sea, China. Jean Nicolet was wrong. It was Lake Michigan, not the Pacific. But others would follow his dream, Joliet, La Salle, the Laverandres, and they would map most of North America from the Rockies to the Gulf of Mexico. It was our 35th anniversary. To celebrate, we were on our way to Mama Rosie's, where we had our first date. That's when we heard coming from the radio. So we stopped and listened. It helped us get to safety. So when I think of, I think of our anniversary, because now we have even more to celebrate. Join us as we look back at previous investiture ceremonies honoring great Canadians. Watch The Order of Canada exclusively on Rogers TV. Experts. I'm your host Barbara Balfour and on tonight's show we're talking about how to put your best self online with very special guests Chanel McFarland and Natasha Kaufman. Now ladies before we went to break we talked a little bit about the importance of authenticity and how to network online in a way that feels genuine and meaningful. Um, I know Chanel that you've got a great blog post up about this so you've obviously got a few mm -hmm. tricks up your sleeve to share with the audience. Talk to us a little bit about how you can, first of all, ease your nerves before a virtual networking event, but you know, more, even more importantly, how you can make the most out of it. How would you approach someone? How would you follow up with someone? And how would you basically get what you're looking for without turning them off? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, first, before networking, if you're feeling a little nervous, I always say to practice, right? So practice with the, with your laptop. You can record yourself uh, introducing yourself, having a conversation. Just get used to how your how your body language comes across on screen. Of course, you know how your background and everything else appears on screen. That's a really great way to start feeling comfortable. And then when it comes to just having those conversations, you can start thinking about what are some conversation starters, right? What are some things that you can say to introduce yourself and sort of break the ice? Similar thing that you would have done, you know, in a pre-COVID world uh, when you'd go to a networking event and go up to someone. What are some things that you can say to sort of ease into that conversation um, and have sort of an organic and authentic conversation? After that, the, the follow-up is so important. I say the art of the follow-up is really key to making a really great impression. And so I actually like when I can to send a physical thank you note because uh, it goes a long way. So if I am able to have someone's address, I love just writing out a quick note and popping that in the mail. I mean, I know I'm not the only one these days that loves getting mail more than before. It's super exciting. But it also just shows the person that your interaction meant a lot to them. Uh, and so you want to show them that you know you're, they mean a lot to you. Uh, here's a thank you note, uh, and that just goes a long way in making a really great impression. What I've been really struck by in this sort of new super digital age is that sometimes old school really is the best school and the best way to really stand out is like you say, Chanel, mm. to send those handwritten thank you notes, even to pick up the phone and make a call, uh, you know, old fashioned mm. snail mail. Natasha, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. You're a very busy, very successful woman. I'm sure you have people approaching you all the time with all kinds of requests. What are some of the requests that make you more inclined to say, yes, I'll do it? And what are some of the requests that kind of turn you off? Well, I, I think if someone uh, has done their research on me and um, mm -hmm. engages in a really thoughtful manner, I'm always happy to uh, reciprocate. I, I think the um, sometimes when I get those emails where I might get an email in the morning and they'll say, hey, I just really want to connect with you. Um, can we meet for coffee tomorrow? And that just <laughs> to me shows that they're not taking and believe it or not, I get a lot of those. And it's just yeah. not or, you know, or doing a call the next day. They're just not taking into consideration that 
Um, if you look at my schedule, like I might not be able to even have my own coffee for the next 10 days because I'm like starting my day at eight o'clock in the morning and go right until seven. So um, it's so I think that the key is being really thoughtful and mindful of um, that person's like life and circumstance. And I know that when I reach out to people, I'm always uh, mindful of that. I'm always, I, you know, I remember years ago when I was just starting out in our industry, I would always read the newspaper and the magazines and I would send a note to a journalist if I liked an article, not because I necessarily needed to pitch them on anything, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, their effort and what they, what they are doing. And so that has, you know, stayed with me all these years. And I just think if I'm reaching out to someone, I want to make sure that I'm acknowledging something really great that they've done or that they are currently doing, um, or make sure that I've done my research on them. And, and also mm -hmm. being want to be really mindful of their time. Uh, time is our biggest mm -hmm. commodity. That's, that's all we have. So um, if we're spending it with someone, you want to make sure you're spending it with someone that actually um, appreciates the fact that you've, um, you've dedicated the time, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Chanel, you mentioned the importance of following up. You know, when is too mm -hmm. soon? What follow-ups what you do talk talk us a little bit through some of the logistics of that and and do you have any examples of sort of a, an online mm. relationship um, that you were able to spark through a virtual networking session where you know some sort of partnership um, was sparked absolutely well in, in terms of the follow-up I in a pre-COVID world, I'd probably say a few days, but I mean, now people have so much going on. You don't know what they have on their plate. And so I would say giving at least a week of a follow-up, especially if it's just really not urgent uh, before you're following up and just seeing if you'll be able to get a response from them. Uh, but yes, I've been able to spark some really great uh, relationships online uh, from friendships to partnerships. Uh, even my husband, I, I met online. And so uh, it's definitely a place where I, I feel familiar connecting with people. And again, I would just say there, uh, when it comes to, to foster relationships, you do want to lead with being personal um, and being specific, as, as Natasha was talking about. And I think even one thing I would say is even addressing the person and spelling their name correctly. That's that's one I would say pet peeve of mine is if someone spells yeah. my name incorrectly. I'm like, well, you haven't really spent the time to you know add in that detail. Uh, so I think that that definitely goes a long way in making a good impression. Um, and also just making your note short and sweet. Nobody necessarily wants to take the time to read a really long email or essay. So being concise in your message, being specific, and also just showcasing what's in it for them, especially if you're trying to initiate some sort of partnership. When that person's reading your email, they want to know, well, what's in it for them? So if you can start thinking about that and frame that into your message, it's more likely to be uh, well received and you'll get the response that you desire. So many people lose sight of that. They lose sight of the importance of answering the question from the reader or the audience, why should I care? And so that's a really great point mm -hmm. to make. Now, before uh, we went to break in the previous segment, we touched a little bit on safety, especially as a woman, and you know when to allow yourself to be vulnerable online and so on. And both of you brought up really great points in, the, in terms of the fact that many of us are meeting our colleagues, our clients, even our romantic partners online. Um, and when you don't necessarily have the opportunity to meet each other face to face, you may not necessarily mm -hmm. have the opportunity for your gut to kick in or that sort of spidey sense of feeling to cut in. It's, it's, it's just not the same, I find, for me mm -hmm. um, online versus face to face. And, and Chanel, you have something interesting on your, on your blog again on um, mm -hmm. how to do that background check on a potential employer or client mm -hmm. talk us through some of the steps we need to make to make sure that whoever we're dealing with online is actually legit because although we've opened up a whole new world to ourselves there's also the massive mm -hmm. potential fraud that goes along with it Absolutely. Well, we are seeing a lot of fraud happening right now during COVID-19. Of course, people just want to take advantage of people, unfortunately. And so there's a number of things that you can do to actually do a background check. So whether it's just for a person or for an employer to ensure that they're actually someone that's legitimate. So as we were talking about before, I think a Google search is really important. Doing a simple Google search, seeing what exists, going through current news, seeing what things have been said, any news articles, and then reaching out to your network. See if there's anybody that knows that person or knows that company. Company has had a previous interaction with them. Getting as much information as you can ahead of time, that will allow you to avoid any sort of negative situations there. You know what I think is amazing is how much time we tend to put into researching a new restaurant or a hotel or a vacation place mm -hmm. versus 
that we allow into our innermost circle. Natasha, I saw you nodding your head earlier. Did you have something to add to that? No, I mean, I, I totally agree. I, I think that we need to do the proper research and, and it's available to us. And you're 100% mm -hmm. right. Like we do the research when we're researching a restaurant to make sure that, um, you know, it's on the top 10 list. So why aren't we doing the same thing uh, perhaps with humans or with businesses? So, um, or, you know, or some of our professional relationships. So I, I, I totally agree. I just think that sometimes you do have to take um, things with a grain of salt and I do believe your gut instinct really doesn't let you down and whether it's mm -hmm. a digital relationship or an in-person relationship it's still there um, and, and you kind of know and you just have to follow it it's, I think sometimes um, if we don't follow it it's it's because we're choosing not to not because it isn't working and so I strongly suggest that um, if your spidey senses are going off um, then they're going off for a reason. Great points. Now we have a few minutes left until the end of our segment tonight. Our time together has just flown right by. Uh, mm -hmm. Chanel, I wanted to give you the mm -hmm. chance to leave our audience with any parting tips, thoughts, or um, any upcoming um, projects that you're involved in that you'd like to highlight. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, I write, I live for this stuff. I love talking about personal branding and careers. And so I have my blog, Do Well, Dress Well. I've been posting each week some really great blog posts on how you can navigate this pandemic with your career and your personal brand. Uh, so I encourage you to visit that and read those posts. I have some free guides as well uh, that walks you through some of the tech and the tools that I walked you through in this segment on how to show up as your best self on your video calls. And of course, you can always connect with me. I'm always on social media. I love having conversations about careers and personal branding navigating this pandemic so I encourage you to reach out if you have any questions or you just want to say hi do well dress well .com. it is a treasure trove of information I hope <laughs> that everyone who watches the show goes and checks out Chanel McFarland's mm -hmm. blog thank you so much and finally Natasha you. did you have any uh, parting tips or um, insights that you wanted to share with our viewers before the end of our show tonight yeah. I mean, I think whether it's personal branding or corporate branding, I think you need to uh, be thoughtful and mindful uh, with what you're putting um, out there from a digital perspective. Um, we do um, certainly do personal branding, but we do so much in the corporate space, making sure that we're aligning our clients' values and purpose um, to the content that's actually being put out there. Um, so you can learn a bit more on www.nkpr.net, or you can uh, certainly follow along at Natasha um, NKPR as well. And thank you. Love everything that you've been saying. Thank you so much to you both for your time, for sharing your wisdom and your insight with our audiences at a time where it could not be more relevant. Thank you so much to you both for uh, joining us tonight. And for those of you who are watching us from home, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you again in the studio next week. Have a great night. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Hi, I'm Harriet Clooney, chef here in Ottawa and host of Scrap Cooking. Join me each week and I will show you how to reduce your food waste and save a bit of money. Hope to see you soon. September 20th, 2007. January the 9th, 2003. December 14th, 
2013. On August the 13th, 2009, Dr. Ian McGilvery and his team saved my life. Too many people die every year waiting for an organ donation. Please, let's eliminate the wait list. As an organ donor, you can save up to eight lives and enhance the lives of 75 others. Pledge a gift to life. You'll be glad you did. TV, Ottawa. The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Carissimi amici, buongiorno. Oggi cominciamo una nuova puntata di Tele30 e oggi è una puntata molto molto interessante perché eh, nella prima parte par parleremo naturalmente della prevenzione medica e col nostro dottor Luciano Cagris ci parlerà un pochettino dell'esaurimento nervoso. È eh, normale, questo è il periodo, con la, con la neve siamo un po' tutti più nervosi. Invece nella seconda parte andiamo a St. Anthony Soccer Club per... Eh, eh, lì hanno festeggiato il, la giornata mondiale della lingua italiana nel mondo e invece nella terza parte andiamo a Sala San Marco andiamo alla festa del calcio che quest'anno è stato veramente un grandissimo successo abbiamo presentato uh, delle, dei premi a tanti, a tanti giovani a tante squadre del del nostro calcio del pallone qui a Ottawa e invece nella terza parte andiamo uh, naturalmente con un po' di musica e andiamo a ascoltare due miei cari amici che una è Isabella Longo e l'altro è Cece Barretta con dei successi veramente belli 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 io vi auguro solo una buona visione e ci sentiamo più tardi Salve cari amici, oggi vogliamo parlare di un argomento un po' specifico, un po' insomma interessa a tutti quanti, nessuno dice io non ho mai sentito di questo, 